In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Ark of the New Covenant, pray for us. St. Ignatius, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, What's good to see you all again. Uh, Night number two of a retreat is always the one that makes us preachers nervous because that's the one when nobody might show up, but here you are. So (laughs) thank you for uh, coming together once again so that we can continue reflecting upon the Most Holy Eucharist, especially in this sacred season of Lent as we prepare our hearts for the great Paschal joy of Easter. Uh, We left off last night kind of just getting in to uh, reflecting a little bit about the beautiful act of Holy Communion. Um, Before we take that up again, there's just one thing from last night that I want to return to and sort of clean up my testimony a little bit uh, about the idea of worship and sacrifice. Just one other thing I wanted to say about it before we move on uh, to Holy Communion, and that's to think just a little bit about the relationship of sacrifice and worship to the whole idea of relationship. So our worship, uh, our acts of adoration of God, the sacrifice, all of these things have a lot to do with this concept of a relationship. And that's very important because if you think about this concept of relationship is very important to God. The very nature of God is a trinity of three persons in relationship. Relationship is even essential to who God is himself. And because we are made in the image and likeness of God, this is one of the things that that means. It means that we are made for relationship too. It means that we are fulfilled. We find our identity even in our relationships. Certainly our relationship with God, our relationships here on this earth, they are what in a very essential way uh, help us to be who we truly are. We are made in God's image and likeness. Uh, Therefore, relationship is essential to us too. All through these covenants, these acts of worship and sacrifice that we talked about in the Old Testament last night, what God does is he reaches out to form a relationship with his people. Uh, That's what he's doing when he forms a covenant first uh, with Adam and Eve, just with a family at first, and then he kind of widens the circle out gradually. He forms ever wider relationships. Uh, with Moses, with Abraham, and eventually through Christ with the entire human race. He desires to form this covenant, this relationship with us. You see these covenants uh, kind of working their way through the Old Testament, uh, leading to the great eternal and definitive covenant in Christ. In every case, God is reaching out to his people, forming a relationship, and always, in every case, uh, an essential part of that relationship is worship. God gives them instructions about how they are to worship him as part of this relationship that he's formed with them. Um, That's so important because our relationship with God is our fundamental relationship. It's the relationship without which none of our other relationships make sense or even would be possible in the first place. Since God created us, since it is God himself who is holding us in being right now at this very moment, Without God, we wouldn't even have any other relationships. So we kind of have to see everything that we do, everything that we are, all of our relationships among ourselves in the context of the God who makes all these relationships possible. Our relationship with him is so fundamental in that sense. Uh, How do we do that? How do we keep that balance in our lives, remembering who God is, how important he is, how central he is to everything, to everything in my life? We do that by worship. We do that by worship. That's why God places worship at the center of every one of these relationships that we see in the covenants of the Old Testament and certainly in the new covenant that we participate in in Christ. When we worship God, 
We sort of establish the parameters of our relationship with him. We say, you're God, I'm not. That is fundamentally what we're doing when we worship. If we're doing nothing else, we are at least saying that basic thing. You're God, I'm not. And of course, many other things flow from that, but on an essential level, when we pray, when we worship, when we adore God, we are at least saying that. There is a God, you're him, and I am not. That's what we're doing when we worship in a very fundamental sense. Um, and that sort of continues to maintain these basic parameters of this relationship with God. When we do that regularly, we kind of remind ourselves of this fundamental truth of the universe, that there is a God. He wants to be in a relationship with me. He is in a relationship with me. And I'm kind of acknowledging that in a real, tangible way every time uh, I worship him. Um, <clears throat> that's kind of what keeps our relationship with God up and running. That's why he asks us to worship him regularly. Uh, it's so that we can maintain that relationship, uh, reminding ourselves, expressing to him that we understand these fundamental parameters of this relationship. So I think it's always good to view this concept of worship, this concept of sacrifice that we offer to God within that sort of framework, that we're doing so because he has reached out to us formed this relationship, and this is how we kind of, in a very basic way, attend to that relationship, uh, remind ourselves of its basic parameters, uh, and kind of keep ourselves on track, keep our priorities in line uh, in that sense. So I just wanted to give that little postscript to last night, um, and now uh, we've focused on some vital aspects of our most important activity as Catholics. We've talked about the Holy Mass as a sacrifice, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross made present for us right here. We've spoken about mass as the perfect act of worshiping God, uh, what we're really here to do uh, more than anything else. We've talked about the Eucharistic prayer as the highlight and apex of that, uh, of that great moment. And now we'll spend some time this evening uh, reflecting upon the beautiful act of Holy Communion. Uh, and just to remind where we kind of ended up last night, it's important that we spent basically the whole first evening talking about Mass before we even got to Holy Communion because of the magnificent, infinite value of Mass even by itself. And again, that's not to say that we shouldn't receive communion whenever we possibly can. It's recommended to us by the church. It's a beautiful, wonderful thing. We'll talk about all the reasons why. But just being at Mass is already an incredible gift. Uh, to be in the presence of this sacrifice of our salvation uh, is such a wonderful thing. It's an incredible privilege for us to be present at our Lord's worship of his Father in heaven, which he allows us to participate in, uh, each in his own way. Uh, I mentioned uh, last night that everything I was saying about worship and sacrifice and all that was just me paraphrasing the book of Hebrews. Uh, so tonight, everything I'm going to say about Holy Communion is just paraphrasing the Gospel of John, uh, in particular what's known as the Bread of Life Discourse. So if you want some additional reading and reflection about this kind of stuff that we'll talk about tonight, that's in John uh, chapters 6, 7, and 8 basically. Um, and so to start, I just want to read just a little bit uh, from John chapter 6, um, kind of to get us started uh, on this beautiful reflection about Holy Communion. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that a man may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, 
so he who eats me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. This he said in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. You could spend your whole life just reflecting upon those 11 stanzas. So magnificent, uh, wonderful reflection upon our Lord's great gift of himself to us in the most blessed sacrament of the altar in Holy Communion. Uh, it is truly his flesh. It is truly his blood uh, given to us for our nourishment and for our communion with him. So we can't ever forget what an incredible life-shattering thing it is that Almighty God permits us to do when we receive Holy Communion. So we should really try to resist the urge just to kind of blow through the line, uh, which in one sense, Holy Communion can and should be a very holy routine for us. It's a wonderful thing that it is a routine, uh, that it should be a regular sort of almost indispensable part of our spiritual life. That's a good thing. But we should always try to remember what an astonishing thing it is that we are being permitted to do in being able to receive our Lord's sacred body and blood uh, in Holy Communion. Because that's what it is. It's not bread and wine anymore in any way other than appearances, uh, which in theology are, are known as the accidents. It accidentally still looks like bread and wine, but essentially, and what it really is, is the body and blood of Christ. That's why, by the way, we worship the Blessed Sacrament. That's why we refer to Eucharistic adoration, not merely, and Eucharistic worship, not merely Eucharistic reverence, not merely Eucharistic piety, but Eucharistic adoration. We worship the Blessed Sacrament because it truly is our Lord, Jesus Christ, true God and true man, his body, his blood, his soul, and his divinity. It's where the beautiful ancient practice of genuflecting comes from. That's an act of adoration. It's an act of worship. The only things in, church, in the church that we genuflect to are the Blessed Sacrament and, under certain circumstances, the Holy Cross, uh, things that we need to adore, essentially. Uh, <clears throat> It's his body and blood which have been sacrificed for us, as we know. And he allows us in Holy Communion not just to be present to the sacrifice, which we have been simply by being at Mass, not just to worship the sacrifice, which the, we have the opportunity to do simply by being at Mass, but to ingest the sacrifice. To ingest the sacrifice. By the way, another thing that we shouldn't do lightly, that we do every day, we probably just did it, myself included, without thinking too much about it, is making the sign of the cross on ourselves when we do this. It's worth thinking about what you're saying, what you're expressing when you do that. You're saying, I want to impress the cross into my mind and my heart and my whole self. I want the cross to sort of be fixed on me in a real, physical serious way. We shouldn't just say, mm, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, I'm in. Like, I want the cross to define who I am and the way I think and the way my heart works. So it's a fairly serious thing for us to do, even just to make the sign of the cross. We do these beautiful things that we have in our church so routinely, it's worth pausing every once in a while and thinking, ooh, that's a significant thing for me to do. Uh, another example of that is we also pray the Lord's Prayer tonight. It's worth thinking about what we're praying for in the Lord's Prayer, as an aside. Uh, for example, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's a fairly serious standard to ask God to hold us to. Please, God, only forgive me in as much as I am willing to forgive others. We're basically asking God to hold us to that standard. I only want you to forgive me as much as I'm willing to forgive others. Now, when we pray that, we're asking him to give us the grace to forgive others. So we're asking him to help us to do it and to live up to that incredible standard. But we are holding ourselves to it, and that's another thing that it's worth not just kind of blowing through. We forgive those who trespass against us. Yeah, okay. Uh, whoa. <laughs> that's a remarkable thing to pray for. So um, there's all these beautiful moments in our faith, which because they are wonderfully routine and become these pillars of our life, uh, it just gives us an opportunity to 
try every once in a while, especially in sacred seasons like Lent, to say, I'm going to think about what I'm really praying here. I'm going to think about what I'm really doing when I do something as simple as make the sign of the cross or something as regular as something I do so regularly as receive Holy Communion. So we ingest the sacrifice when we receive his sacred body and blood. Uh, we shouldn't do that lightly. Um, that old phrase, you are what you eat, is nowhere more true than with the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, this is the most powerful food in the world. St. Augustine made a very beautiful point that with every other type of food, when we receive it, our body breaks it down and is integrated into part of us. But with the Blessed Sacrament, the reverse happens. When we consume and digest the Blessed Sacrament, instead of us turning it into part of us, he turns us into part of him. Instead of us transforming the food into ourselves, the food transforms us into part of it. Uh, that's what's really going on. So when we receive Christ's sacrificed and glorified body and blood, we are saying, I want to be transformed by this sacrifice. In a real sense, I want to be transformed into this sacrifice. You are what you eat. I want to be what I am consuming. Christ himself, in a very real sense, and Christ's sacrifice himself. I want the cross to be impressed upon my very self. It's dangerous. It's dangerous to receive Holy Communion. It's dangerous to our pride. It's dangerous to our comfort zones. It's dangerous to our selfishness, dangerous to all our little false gods that we cling to for comfort. In that sense, it's a hazardous thing to do, but it's a beautifully hazardous thing to do because those are things that we should want to break free from. And if there's one thing that'll do it, it's the most blessed sacrament, uh, received regularly and worthily. Um, <clears throat> we talked about some of the sort of false notions of what coming to Mass is about last night. So with respect to receiving Holy Communion, if it's just kind of a pleasant community meal, I wouldn't bother. I'd just stay home and sleep in and play golf and watch the Titans game. Spend your Sunday in other ways. Uh, but it's not just that. It is that. It is a beautiful expression of our community. It is a beautiful source of unity among us. Uh, it is so many wonderful things. But it's the most important thing in the world. Uh, God does something incredible. His body broken for us, his blood poured out for us. He invites us to digest his sacrifice, to be nourished by it and comforted by it and transformed by it. Uh, the beautiful words of St. Thomas Aquinas, it is a most sacred banquet in which Christ is received, the memory of his passion is renewed, the mind is filled with grace, and a pledge of future glory is given to us. What a magnificent thing we have the privilege to participate in. And we should participate in this sacred banquet as often as we can. But we should know what we're doing. We should think about what we're doing. We should prepare for what we're doing. We should be in awe of it. There's a reason why the Blessed Sacrament is worshipped, as we've said before, reverence given only to God, because the Blessed Sacrament is the true body of our Lord, Je body and true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we can welcome Him within ourselves. Uh, we fall down in adoration and awe and humility in this great sacrament of love. Um, many of the saints have described what a soul is like immediately after receiving Holy Communion. You are almost a tabernacle yourself for a little while at least while your body is digesting the Blessed Sacrament. Um, and so this is why it's such a beautiful thing to pray uh, after receiving Holy Communion. It's why the church sort of builds in a little time of prayer into the Mass after receiving Holy Communion. If you can stay after Mass or pray as you're driving home or whatever, it's a beautiful thing to think about. The Blessed Sacrament is still within me. He's still with me, in, 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 inside me, literally, in a very real sense. It's a beautiful thing. And uh, let him kind of diffuse himself throughout my person and continue to transform me. A beautiful thing about the sacraments in general is that they, this is a kind of theological description, the sacraments are signs which bring about what they signify. So here's what that means. The sacraments are signs which bring about what they signify. Think about baptism. 
as a sacrament. It's a sign. What does it signify? What does it look like? It looks like a washing. Uh, you use water and you, it looks like a ritual washing. That's what it looks like. And in fact, that is what it does. On a deeper, much deeper level than a physical one, it creates this beautiful washing of a soul, uh, purifying, cleansing. Uh, with the Blessed Sacrament, it looks like food and drink. It looks like bread and wine. That's the sign involved, which means it looks like nourishment and it looks like delight. There's a reason it's not bread and water, uh, besides the fact that water was probably not wise to drink in the first century. Um, but beyond that, wine is something which gives delight to people's hearts. So we are nourished and we are delighted. These are the things which should happen to us at the deepest level of our souls. Uh, unless you happen to be a saint with a very special charism like uh, St. Catherine of Siena, who I think um, was supposed to have survived only on the Blessed Sacrament, like for years, um, but most of us do have to eat lunch. But, <laughs> but what you should truly be nourished at the deepest level of your soul by our Lord's sacred body. And you should find your deepest delight and your truest richness by his sacred blood uh, received. So we've said that Mass is the most fundamental, is most fundamentally the sacrifice of Christ and made present for us. And our Lord is the one who does the really important work. But what we do is important too. And so um, it's an inexhaustible mystery. I was talking to somebody last night after, um, after the talk about what a mystery is, uh, a theological mystery. So we use this word sometimes, the word mystery, in sort of the Sherlock Holmes CSI sense of the word uh, to describe kind of a whodunit. It's a, it's a mysterious thing because I don't know, and then by the end of the episode, I know. The mystery is revealed. Um, and sometimes people will use this, especially we preachers will sometimes use this as an excuse not to preach about hard topics. Um, any of you St. Patrick's people, if I ever say this, especially on Trinity Sunday, please feel free to kick me. Um, well, the Holy Trinity is a mystery, so I'm not going to bother trying to preach about it. <laughs> That's not what a theological mystery is. We sometimes think of a mystery as like, there's something unknown and maybe I'll never know it, or uh, I can't know it. That's not what a mystery is in, in faith. A mystery of faith is something, it's not something you can't know anything about, it's something that you can never know everything about. So there's plenty we know about God. He's revealed plenty to us. There's plenty we know about the Holy Trinity. There's plenty we know about the Blessed Sacrament, about the Holy Mass, about the community of the church. There's all kinds of things that we know about all these realities, but we can never, ever get to the bottom of them, which is one of the reasons why it's worth receiving Holy Communion more than once in your life. If you could know everything about it, and if it could work all of its effects in you immediately, then you would have no need to receive communion more than once. It would be more like baptism. You were baptized once. You don't ever, you can't ever be baptized again, nor do you need to be. Uh, you can only be confirmed once, nor would you need to be confirmed again. But a sacrament like the Blessed Sacrament of the Altar, Holy Communion, you can never get too close to Christ. You, you can always get closer to him, especially in this earth. You can prepare yourself even more profoundly to be with him even more intimately in heaven. There's always more mysteries to plumb and depths to explore. Um, what that means also is that the Holy Mass really does need to be sort of the center of our everything. Holy Communion should be the highlight of our day. Uh, Mother Teresa talked about how a day for her was always just preparing to receive Holy Communion or kind of coming back down off the high of receiving Holy Communion. She's either going to that or coming away from that. Um, we'll talk more a little bit later about the sort of magnificently concise phrase that Vatican II used about Mass and liturgy and the Holy Eucharist as the source and summit of the Christian life. It's the source and the summit. Uh, we'll come back to that shortly. Um, the sacred heart of Jesus is truly present for us here. This is a beautiful devotion 
uh, to the Sacred Heart that's been present in the church forever, but it kind of kicked up a notch with St. Margaret Mary Alacoque in the 19th century. It's a beautiful thing for us to contemplate the Lord's heart uh, because it's a heart that's on fire with love for us. And that's a wonderful thing. Uh, we have the Lord's heart, which is truly given to us uh, in a more than symbolic way in the Blessed Sacrament. So if we can realize and remember that Holy Mass and Holy Communion are the most important things in our lives and the most important things that we do ever, then everything in our life will flow out of it and we will be defined by the sacrificial love of Christ that we can only fully experience in this context. So this is what Vatican II means when it talks about Mass being the source of our life and the summit of our life. So it's the source, it's that from which everything flows, and it's the summit, it's that towards which everything was directed, uh, is directed. So not only should Mass inspire everything in our life, all of our day-to-day -day stuff, our regular activities, our regular activities of our life should also propel us back towards our experience at Mass and towards receiving Holy Communion. Everything, our work, our family life, our leisure, our little annoyances, uh, our difficulties, everything that we experience, we can see in the context of the source and summit of our life, which is our Lord Jesus Christ, as he comes to us most profoundly. Uh, at this point, I'll just mention, the church teaches that there are um, several ways in which Christ is present in the celebration of Mass. Uh, he's present in the community gathered together, and that's very real. Where two or three are gathered together, I am with you. Uh, we are all baptized members of Christ's body, which means in a very real sense, Christ is here. Uh, we are his body, he is the head, we are the members. He is always here when two or three are gathered together in his name. Um, <clears throat> he's also present in the reading of sacred scripture, obviously. We refer to sacred scripture as the word of God. We also refer to Jesus Christ as the word of God, and that's not an accident. The fact that we refer to both of them using that same term. Sacred scripture is the word of God. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the word of God. As we get to know the one, we get to know and understand the other and vice versa. So our Lord is truly present in sacred scripture. He is truly present in the person of the ordained minister who has been consecrated for sacred things and for the church's service. But most profoundly, he is present in his sacred body and blood. That's the only presence which we refer to as being substantial. Uh, it's why we use the term transubstantiation to refer to what happens at Mass. It is substantially our Lord Jesus Christ here present. It's why even though I am an ordained person, please don't genuflect to me. It's why even though you all are baptized and temples of the Holy Spirit and of immense value, I'm not going to genuflect to you. Sorry. Um, we don't even um, we don't even worship the Bible. As much as we revere it and respect it and love it, the only presence of Christ that we worship is the Blessed Sacrament because it's him truly present. Now, <clears throat> I realize that I do this for a living and obviously I'm going to think this stuff is important. Um, so why am I giving you this hard sell about all this being the most important thing in your life? Because uh, I don't need to. I'm not paid on commission. So whether there's two people at Sunday Mass or 2,000 people at Sunday Mass, uh, you know, it doesn't affect me on a natural level. Um, why am I kind of giving you the hard sell about this? And I hope it comes across in the way I, uh, I'm talking about it. I care about you. Your pastor, Father Titus, cares about you. The church cares about you. Uh, and we want the absolute best for you. And this is it. I mean, this is the good news. If you want your life to be infused with meaning and purpose, if you want to grow in true peace, even amid the great difficulties and real struggles of your life, if you want to have a firm anchor that keeps you grounded and attached to the most important realities that there are, then love the Mass more and more. Come to Mass more and more. Make the Mass the absolutely indispensable part of your week. 
Uh, this is a great gift I was given by my Protestant parents. Um, they kind of got all this stuff about the importance of worship. I don't think we ever missed a Sunday of going to church as a child. And even though it wasn't mass, and I realize now that there were things that weren't there that we do have here, it was a wonderful education in the importance of regular worship. Uh, and it really should become like breathing. I mean, it should be like, I would rather not breathe than, assuming you're not in a coma or something, not go to mass on Sunday. Uh, that should be so central and sort of so indispensable to your whole way of thinking. Now, it won't make everything in your life easy. I mentioned a few times last night, and I'll mention a few times tonight, and a few times tomorrow. This is not magic. It won't make everything in your life magically easy. In fact, our Lord promises a fairly great share of his cross to those who love him the most. Uh, so, stand by. Uh, but it will give you strength, comfort, stability, and a true peace that the world can't give. Our, our Lord's, we are a religion of the cross. We're profoundly realistic. We don't take Christ off the cross. He's right there. Suffering is real, death is real, and we don't turn our eyes away from it. We, we kind of force ourselves to look. It's right there at the front of the church. Uh, it's why the kind of beautiful Catholic tradition of having crucifixes all over the place in your house and, you know, in every room of the hospital and all these kind of things is so beautiful and so important. We have to look at the cross and realize several things. Suffering is real in this life. Death is real in this life. Pain is real in this life. Loss is real in this life. Grief is real in this life. But none of these things get the last word because we don't end the liturgical year on Good Friday. Good Friday is important and we need to experience it on our way to Easter Sunday, on our way then to Pentecost, on our way then to Christ the King Sunday. You know, we kind of move through these great mysteries because all of them are real and put together they're a magnificent kind of pastiche of what reality is like. And without getting too deeply into my funeral homily, uh, just to say that that's our view of why all of this makes sense, because we're not shying away from the reality of suffering or even death, but we're saying these things don't have to be meaningless. These things can have a profound, significant meaning, and we don't have to be alone in them, because even Almighty God somehow, as I said last night, the source of all life found a way to share the experience of death with us so that we are not alone. And if we cling to him, because we really are part of his body, and if we stay close to him, then he will pull us through the experience of death all the way to the resurrection. Okay. I want to talk just a little bit now to shift gears about the actual so-called Eucharistic revival, which we're participating in as a church right now. Um, so the church in the United States is expending fairly considerable energy at the moment on this national Eucharistic revival. And what got this started was everybody sort of panicked in 2019 when there was a study that came out uh, from uh, the, the Pew Institute. And I don't know if any of you saw this. It sort of chillingly reported that 69% of self-identified Catholics in the United States stated that they did not believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. So over two-thirds of people who say they're Catholic don't believe these things we've been talking about. At least that's what this study showed. Now, while that particular finding received a fair amount of attention, understandably, if you kind of dig down a little bit, there's some more data in there, which I find actually more interesting. For example, only 64% of Catholics reported a certain belief in the existence of God. So 69% believe, don't believe in the real presence. Only 64% of Catholics believe in God, which is an interesting... Anyway, I don't know what you mean when you say you're Catholic then. 58% uh, of Catholics said their faith was important to them. And here's the real kicker, I think. Only 61% of Catholics admitted to attending Mass any more frequently than once a month. 
So the fact that those numbers are close makes sense to me. That about the same number of people who go to Mass more regularly than once a month believe in the real presence. That's what, that's what I find interesting, this connection of worship and belief. I think that's what this study really shows. Because this is all about a relationship, and your relationships grow or suffer based on the time you give to them. We know this from our human relationships. And human relationships do have seasons. We have people, you might have a best friend in your 20s that by the time you're 50, you haven't talked to in 25 years. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just part of human life. But it's because you never spent any time together. Maybe you moved, maybe you drifted apart, you realized you didn't have anything in common anymore, and all of a sudden you're just not spending any time together, and then you don't have a relationship anymore. So it's really not that surprising that if I don't ever go to Mass, I don't really have much of a relationship with God, especially with the centrality of worship and the way that the Catholic Church understands it that we've been talking about. If I'm not worshiping God, I'm not doing the one indispensable thing to keep my relationship alive. So I don't find it all that surprising that there's this correlation between regular worship and fundamental belief in what's going on here. So this is kind of the backdrop to what led our bishops in the United States to undertake this initiative of Eucharistic revival. Um, again, we've talked about this beautiful notion of the source and summit, uh, the actual uh, phrase from Vatican II, from Sacrosanctum Concilium, which, by the way, was the first document of Vatican II. The very first thing the council decided to talk about was this, which shows its importance. You know, we're not going to start with something else. We're going to start with the most important thing. The liturgy, the Holy Eucharist, is the summit towards which the activity of the church is directed. At the same time, it is the font from which all her power flows. It's beautiful. The summit toward which the activity of the church is directed and the font from which all her power flow, flows, the summit and the source. That means that worship that man renders to God, that humankind renders to God, is not secondary, but it's a primary requirement of a well-lived life, of an authentic worldview. Again, uh, we talked some about this last night. Spirituality is not optional, and the way that we worship is not just our preferred flavor of ice cream. Uh, it's central, uh, it's essential. Very commonly, and there's a whole lot of reasons for this that go back hundreds of years, but very commonly, and we might fall into this occasionally too, we can think of our religious life as another one of our several hobbies. So like, you know, I'm making these up. I play golf and I fly airplanes, I don't do any of these, and uh, I, um, well, <laughs> I own a set of golf clubs, but you wouldn't want to see me do it. It's not edifying. Um, so I play golf. I, you know, I'm in the Kiwanis Club. I volunteer at the soup kitchen. All these are good things, you know. Um, and I go to St. Ignatius, and I, you know, um, you know, hang out with my grandkids and Destin. You know, it's kind of one among a list of several different things. In other words, like a hobby, uh, and. The world, the secular world around us tends to tolerate us if we will treat our faith like a hobby. In other words, if we don't take it too seriously, uh, if we don't actually define our lives by it, if we're kind of comfortable, then the world around us is okay with, if we wanna kind of come here and do some kind of weird praying stuff, I guess that's all right, but like, don't get in my business about it, you know? But what we're saying is that this is not just another element of my life. This is not just another hobby. This is not just another way I kill an hour on the weekends. This is the source and the summit of my entire life. Uh, this is the essential realities of my life that I'm attending to here. That, by the way, here's your canon law for tonight, uh, is why the church refers to herself fundamentally not as a club, not even as... Um, a sort of religious denomination, the Catholic Church defines itself as a society. Now, we could talk for an hour about this, which we won't, but the point of that is a society is a group of persons who live their life together and every part of who you are is affected. We are a society, not a club. 
and we organize ourselves that way and we think about ourselves that way. And this is what we do in this room is our essential, most essential activity as a society. Okay, um, so let's get into this a little bit more. This is so important because the Catholic faith is not spiritually oriented group therapy. We said that last night. It's not just kind of a philosophy uh, or even a spirituality, um, nor are we just a particularly wide-ranging charitable organization, although we do all of these things quite well and better than most others. Um, <clears throat> but again, when we worship God, we're acknowledging this reality. He's God, I'm not. We're establishing these basic parameters of what we're doing here in this society. Um, <clears throat> When you think about the Ten Commandments and the fact that they're often uh, depicted on two tablets, sometimes you'll see the picture and the first tablet's got commandments one through three and the second tablet has commandments four through ten. If you're OCD like me, the, uh, the fact that they're <laughs> kind of not balanced is very annoying. Why aren't there five on one tablet and five on the other? The reason is that the first three commandments have to do with our relationship with God and four through ten have to do with our relationship with our fellow uh, men and women. And the first tablet is the first tablet for a reason. In fact, the first commandment is the first commandment for a reason. We've said that when we worship, we're saying, you're God, I'm not. That is what the first commandment means. It basically is stating that, hey, remember that I'm God and act accordingly. And in a very real sense, commandments two through 10 point right back to that. And every sin ultimately is a first commandment problem in some way or other, it, you're saying something else I'm going to care about a little bit more than God right now, or something else I'm going to place in God's position right now in some way. Commandments 2 through 10 point back. Uh, and the first three commandments are the first three because if those three aren't in some semblance of order, then you won't be good at 4 through 10 for very long. 1 through 3 are the foundation on which 4 through 10 stand. Eventually, you will talk yourself into anything. I think human history kind of proves this. We humans are extremely good at self-delusion and convincing ourselves that we're right. Uh, and I refer you to history if you want some examples. Uh, even 20th century history, even history that we've lived through, um, are signs of this. We've got to have those four three commandments in order, in order to keep ourselves honest and stay focused about four through ten. I bring all this up to talk about actually the third commandment, uh, which I honestly think might be the most neglected of the whole bunch. Um, and that's remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, the third commandment, and not just about, you know, go to mass and don't go to work on Sunday. That's kind of the very basic meaning, but I think it's really about the centrality of worship. So this, all of this that we've been talking about, I think, is what the third commandment's trying to express. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. I think that's a reminder to us from Almighty God, worship is essential to our lives. It's not accidental. It's essential. We have to do it. Again, worship is not about, coming to Mass is not about us fundamentally getting something, although we get an awful lot. It's fundamentally about us giving the worship that God is due. Uh, injustice, in fact. So what is justice? Uh, justice, its technical definition, is rendering to each person what he or she is due. That's what justice is. It's giving everybody what they deserve, essentially. Um, so that means I'm treating you justly when I treat you respectfully. It's unjust for me to, let's say, I mean, in a very stark example, murder you because you have a right to the integrity of your life. So it's unjust for me to do that. Justice is giving to everybody what he is due. So the word religion, its actual definition is justice applied to God. Religion is giving God what he is due. That's why I, it, almost nothing irritates me more than when somebody says, I'm spiritual but not religious. A, I'm pretty sure you just mean you're lazy and you don't want to get up and come to church and you're telling stories to yourself. Um, but B, uh, beyond that, we are supposed to be religious 
if this is real, remember the whole long string of ifs from last night? If all of this is real, if God is real, if all this stuff actually is real, uh, then that has certain consequences for us, and not consequences in a negative sense. Like It means we have to live our lives a certain way if all of that is true. So religion is justice applied to God. Our acts of religion are nothing less than what God deserves because of who he is and who we are in relationship to him. So the third commandment, this obligation to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, clarifies that worship is not optional for us. Uh, And that's why the church, again, continues to insist that participation in Holy Mass every single Sunday as well as on a few other key feast days of the church, is an obligation of the Christian life. Um, Very important. Moreover, as recorded in the end of the Gospel of Matthew, uh, this is the Gospel that is often read at baptisms, uh, our Lord promises to remain with us until the end of the age. He says, go forth, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, I will be with you always until the end of time, until the end of the age. His presence in the world is real. He's faithful to that promise. I will be with you always until the end of the age. And his presence in the world is not merely spiritual. It's not merely sort of hypothetical or intellectual. It's not merely philosophical. Our Lord dwells here substantially. He remains here in this sort of amazing, humble, quiet majesty. You ever want to know what humility is about? That's humility. The the Lord of the universe is willing to be present to us looking like bread and wine. And he is willing to sit quietly, uh, for lack of a better way of expressing it, in a tabernacle just like that, waiting for us to come see him. And he endures all manner of, you know, we all, I'm sure I do it. I probably did it today. I've probably done it today, kind of blowing past the tabernacle without kind of stopping to realize that's the Lord of the universe right there. Uh, it's so easy for us to kind of become, because we have this wonderful opportunity to be close to our Lord, this proximity to the sacred. We have to remember what he's doing for us. He is dwelling here in this beautiful, humble majesty. He is with us until the end of the age. Um, and we have the opportunity to be with him every time we're in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament. So I think that's why it's, um, it's such a beautiful thing uh, for us to have this kind of Eucharistic devotion, to view it, A, in this um, sense of religion, I'm giving God what he is due, it's justice, but that doesn't mean it's bad, and that doesn't mean it's not loving. The beautiful thing about Christ is that Justice and mercy have met. That beautiful line from the psalm, justice and peace have kissed, which is kind of a beautiful image. That's what we believe Christ does for us. He makes justice and mercy come together perfectly in a way that nothing else can. In him, our lives can be perfectly just. We can be giving people what they are truly due as we understand what they're truly due in Christ. People you know, made in the image and likeness of God, temples of the Holy Spirit, endowed of human dignity, with a spirit of mercy that he teaches us as well. So it's a beautiful thing. Um, Okay. Let's talk about truth for a minute. Um, Because I've said several times this sort of little phrase, if all of this is true, then it has these various consequences. Uh, I think one of the challenges to that we live in in this sort of Eucharistic revival, one of the reasons we have to try to think about this kind of thing and work on this as a church, is the notion of truth uh, has essentially evaporated in uh, the world in which we live. So let's talk about what it is and what it isn't. What do we mean when we say something's true? So the church has about a 3,500 year old definition of this that we inherited from the Greeks uh, and we still believe it to this day. Truth is, stick with me, this is a little bit philosophical, truth is the correspondence of the mind to reality. The correspondence of the mind to reality. What that means is something's true if it corresponds to reality. 
So if I say, it is raining inside this church right now, without any disrespect, you can simply say, that is not true. (laughs) Because it doesn't, and why isn't it true? Because it doesn't correspond to reality. Now notice, this may have nothing to do with my sincerity. I might sincerely, firmly believe that it's raining in here. But it is not. (laughs) And so my sincerity of belief doesn't make a thing true or not true. There's this kind of insidious phrasing that's popped up in our society in the last few years about the my, my truth and your truth and his truth and her truth and their truth and everybody's truth. There's only one reality. Things are the way they are, uh, essentially. And a statement that we make is either true or it isn't, depending on whether it corresponds to reality or not. Or it can be a little bit more nuanced than that, the extent to which it corresponds to reality or doesn't. It can be a little bit on a spectrum sometimes, like, um, what's an example? Um, I could say, this church is made of bricks and wood and plutonium. Well, two of those are right. Uh, so, it, cor- it corresponds to reality some, but not all. So, it's, I just bring up that example to say there's a little bit of nuance here sometimes, and we don't want to get too sort of rigid and black and white about this. But it's good to think about what something that's true is. It's true if it corresponds to reality. What's happened in our world, and this is, this is not actually all that recent, this has been brewing for several hundred years, what's happened in our society is that we have rethought this concept and we say, this is why we can have this notion of my truth and your truth and his truth and her truth, if truth is the correspondence of the mind to what I want. If I say it's true because I want it to be, I really might want it to rain in here right now, but it's not raining. And if I say it's raining, you're not actually doing me any favors by helping me to think that it's raining. Um, Now, this has all manner of implications for all manner of stuff uh, in the world and a lot of hot button issues that I don't want to get down that rabbit hole. Um, But in this context, Uh, I think it's important to think about because of this notion that if this stuff is true, then dot, dot, dot. And this is what I mean by that. If this stuff that we're talking about actually corresponds to reality, corresponds to the way things actually are. um, Again, very commonly, people in the world will say, they will think that because the church exists in history and because we have lots of ups and downs and lots of, you know, wicked popes and ineffective priests and, you know, um, inconstant parishioners and the church hasn't existed everywhere at every time. All these historical circumstances somehow mean that our propositions of our faith can't actually be true. I mean, you talk to people, especially people who think they're well-educated, and they'll say, well, yeah, but, you know, you know. (laughs) Well, what do I know? Um... There's this kind of presumption that in some sense we don't really mean it. You know, and th- this is especially easy for people to do about the hard teachings. Uh, and again, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole here, but things like, yeah, but you don't really mean it about contraception, right? You don't really mean it about the indissolubility of marriage. You don't re- you ultimately, and at all point, get back to this, orig- you know, eventually, you don't really mean it about the resurrection. But St. Paul said, if Christ is not raised, your faith is in vain, and that is true. That corresponds to reality. If Christ was not actually raised from the dead, then nothing we're doing here makes any sense. What we, are actu- what we have the gall and temerity to say as Catholic Christians is that, no, the resurrection actually did happen. Like, it really happened, sort of historically, scientifically, you might even say. It actually happened. That happened. The Last Supper happened. The crucifixion happened. The ascension happened. The transfiguration happened. The assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary happened. All of these things correspond to reality. That, by the way, is another thing that we're doing when we worship. When we come to Mass and worship God, we are saying, I believe all of that stuff. I am, I am saying that those things correspond to reality. Here's another thing. 
about truth. I've got to be careful. I can go on about truth all night. Um, here's another thing about truth. It's so real to us that it's a person. Truth is so real that it's, he is a person. Our Lord says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he's not speaking symbolically. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Another way to think about that, you want to spend your whole life contemplating one chapter of the Bible, the first chapter of the Gospel of John. John chapter 1, uh, the hymn to the Logos, in the beginning was the word. Uh, he is the one through whom all things were made. He is what in theology we call the principle of intelligibility. He's the only reason anything makes sense. Jesus Christ. He is reason itself. He is truth itself. Truth himself. Truth is so real that it's a person. This is why, by the way, the church insists upon the integrity of the faith. We say you don't get to sort of pick and choose your doctrines. Part of it is that we believe that our doctrines are received, not invented. This is the whole notion of tradition in the Catholic Church. Father Hammond did not make up the Catholic faith. Thank God. Uh, and in fact, when John Henry Newman, who was a great saint, converted, uh, he, one of the things he said was, it was a great relief to wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and not have to invent my own religion. Which ultimately, if you don't believe in tradition, is what you're doing. Um, and we don't have to do that because we receive our faith from Christ through the church. Uh, and it's from him. And the church has had the opportunity to explore and deepen our understanding over the centuries and engage in theology and philosophy and law and all these wonderful things that help us to kind of live in what all of this means. But the faith is not invented by us. The faith was given to us, handed down to us. Uh, and every bit of it is connected to Christ. There's this notion of the seamless garment. Truth is a seamless garment. Uh, it's all connected, and you, a single thread pulls the whole thing apart. So that's why we insist in the Catholic Church upon integrity of doctrine, and you can't say, well, yeah, I mean, I, I believe in, um, you know, the Eucharist stuff. That sounds pretty good to me, but, but this stuff's too hard. But I don't like the Pope, so I don't believe in the papacy now. Or I didn't like the last pope, so I didn't believe in the papacy then, but I do now, or whatever. Um, we don't do that kind of thing because it's all this kind of integrity. It's all together because it's all true. It all corresponds to reality, and the truth is a person. So when you chop off part of the truth, you're amputating a limb of Christ, basically. Not to put too fine a point on it. This is why, um, one, there's a whole lot of other reasons too, but it's why we talk about being apt to receive Holy Communion, and why the fact that only Catholics and Orthodox people can receive Holy Communion in our church is not an act of exclusion. It's saying, if you're receiving Christ, you're receiving all of Christ. You're receiving the entire truth of Christ. And part of what you're doing when you do that is you're making an act of worship saying, I believe in the whole of Christ, which is why we have to say amen when we receive Communion. When the minister says the body of Christ and you say amen, you're saying, I believe that that's the body of Christ and I believe everything about the truth. I believe Christ and everything that Christ is and means, his entire truth. Uh, so it's a, it's a stark kind of existential thing to do, to say amen when the minister says the body of Christ. This is another thing we do every week or every day and kind of don't think twice about it, but is actually highly significant in a lot of ways. Because you're saying, I believe. I believe everything about what this means. Which is a beautiful thing, because then you're nourished in that belief and you grow in that belief and you're given the strength to live that belief, which is the, what the Blessed Sacrament does for us uh, in so many ways. Okay, it's 7.59, so I'm going to stop. What we will do uh, tomorrow is, <clears throat> We'll talk a little bit about Eucharistic piety, how to kind of deepen and grow in your relationship with Christ in the Eucharist. We'll talk some about prayer. Uh, I'll tell you my vocation story and my conversion story, which are connected um, in that context. Uh, and uh, we'll kind of conclude with a little thought about uh, Our Lady uh, as uh, Queen of the Holy Eucharist 
uh, and as Our Lady of Sorrows, and those things are actually kind of connected. So um, we'll come back to that tomorrow, and in the meantime, let's uh, entrust ourselves to the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.